Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast, where we talk about everything dog. Q and A's with veterinarian professionals, rescue operators, everyday topics. We cover everything dog on this podcast. So make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and make sure you're following us on social media on both Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for listening. Now here's that next episode. Welcome everyone to the Canine Culture Podcast. This is your host, Brittany, and we have a special guest. Her name is Ashley. So welcome to the episode, Ashley. Thank you so much for having me. And so today, um, Ashley is going to discuss with us first aid for pets and specifically first aid for dogs, of course. So Ashley, tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Nursing Development Coordinator with Veterinary Emergency Group. Um, I graduated with my associate's degree in applied science and veterinary technology in 2010 and became a licensed veterinary technician. Um, I graduated from Tarleton State University in 2016 with my bachelor's degree in veterinary technology. And then I achieved my veterinary technician specialty in emergency and critical care through the um, Academy of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care Technicians and Nurses in 2020. So I've been in emergency medicine for almost 20 years now. (laughs) So it's been a long time. Um, So I'm I'm excited to be able to chat with you guys about, about first aid and everything. So this is perfect for someone who's on the emergency side of things, because what we're talking about might help you or might even alleviate you seeing some patients. So, um, first aid, you know, a lot of people don't think about first aid for their pets. And, um, I think it's important to kind of discuss, I mean, just like if you have a child, you want to know at least some of the basics. So whenever you think about general first aid for dogs, what's the most important things that kind of come to mind for you? Your pet is in when you're thinking about first aid. So I have a friend who does search and rescue. So their first aid kit is going to look very different than maybe something that you keep with your pets things. If you're like going to go to the dog park or go on a walk or things like that. So I think it's kind of important to consider the environment. Um, It's always good to have things if your pet gets a cut or something to have bandage equipment. So it's usually like a non-adherent bandage um, and some light bandage material. You want to be very careful and make sure you don't wrap anything too tightly because if you put too much pressure, they can actually lose some circulation to the bottom part of their limb that's below where that bandage is. So um, making sure that you you do that carefully. Um, Also, if you have a pet that gets an injury or something and you wanna clean it, um, it's always safer to use uh, clean water. So use like bottled water um, to rinse that out and then go ahead and put that dressing on there and just take them to a veterinarian. Um, We caution people against using human medications just because There are very few human medications that are over the counter that are safe for pets. And so the safest thing to do is just to call your veterinarian. If you have a veterinarian client pet relationship, a lot of times they can can give you feedback on what you should do if you're not in a place where you can come into the veterinary hospital, or you certainly can call an emergency clinic if there's one by you uh, to get advice there. But the biggest things that we see through the ER service are injuries. So maybe Uh, especially during the holidays, if you go visit, you bring your pets to an environment that already has pets, and then they get overstimulated or excited, and maybe they're all really nice dogs, but they just haven't been around each other, and there's a lot going on, and they get excited, and we see a lot of bite wounds and things, Um, and so those we usually recommend that they be treated by a veterinarian just because you, you usually need antibiotics, and you need some wound cleaning and stuff, but other than that, really as a pet owner, as long as you're proactive with what you're doing, um, you usually can avoid a lot of the things that you would need first aid for. I'm in Texas. So one of the biggest things that we see during summer is like heat stroke. So just bearing in mind, especially if your pet is very toy motivated, a lot of times they just get so focused on playing with the toy that they don't have the wherewithal to be like, it's really hot outside and it's really humid mm-hmm. and I should take a break. And right. so making, making your pets take that break and making sure they don't get overheated um, 
If you do have a pet that you're concerned got overheated, just use tepid, um, like room temperature water, rinse them down. You can put them in your car. So the circulating AC will help cool them down and then they really need to be evaluated by a vet. But if you have a pet that you feel like it's just gotten a little bit too hot, we're still kind of looking at you, we're acting normally, we're just panting really heavily, then I think at that point, that pet could probably just take a little break, <laughs> have some mm -hmm. water, um, and they're usually okay. But usually you can catch it before they get to the heat stroke place. The ones that we see that happen really quickly are, um, you know, pets with smushy faces. So like Frenchies or Bulldogs that just aren't able to cool air normally because they don't have as much nose as bigger dogs do, um, that will like get the zoomies and just run laps around the yard and they just don't know any better. And so I think that's where it's important to think about if you have one of those, we call them brachiocephalic where their noses are short. If you have one of those breeds, just remember that they can't withstand the heat as well as other dogs. Yeah, I think I've heard that I definitely. So I'm in Florida and I think you see that here with, um, Frenchies, pugs, different dogs like that with respect to heat stroke. Um, so one of the things I've been seeing a lot on my recommendations on Amazon and Amazon, I swear they advertise to me every three posts on social media. Um, but I keep seeing these first aid kits. So is that something you would recommend for owners to purchase? And I, I ask that because the obvious answer might be, yes, absolutely. Everyone needs one, but at the same time, if we don't know how to use it, or if there's things in those kits that actually could cause more damage, um, it might be a good perspective to think about maybe instead of purchasing kits, you know, making their own. Um, so what are your thoughts on buying those pre-made doggy first aid kits versus making your own first aid kit? In, in a situation where you may be like in the field and can't get to a veterinary hospital, certainly performing first aid on your own would be better than not performing anything. Um, but the challenge is that it's much easier to perform first aid on a person because I'm able to look at you and say, hey, this might hurt. And like, but I'm doing it for your own good versus pets are going to be like, this hurts and I'm scared. And so you have to be very careful. Even pets that know you may try to bite if something hurts. That's just their natural kind of reaction to pain. It's not going to be because they're being bad or anything like that. So I, I would be hesitant to use like a tourniquet or something. Um, that, and that tends to be what comes in those first aid kits, right? It's the same thing as people. It comes with like wound dressings. It comes with sometimes um, like skin staplers and, and vet wrap, the, the Coflex like stretchy um, bandage material. Um, mm -hmm. And it can come, come with some medications. And I'm very hesitant to recommend any human pain medications for dogs just because you can really do more harm than good if you give them something like ibuprofen they just can't metabolize it the way that we can and it can really damage their kidneys so you want to be very careful before you give them any pain medication unless your doctor has prescribed it for your pet but certainly i think having things to clean wounds so having like a bottle of sterile water or a bottle of sterile saline if you need to flush out a cut that's totally fine having um like i said the non-adherent dressings or having some gauze. If you do get a cut, you can rinse it out, put that over it and just do a light wrap over it to keep it covered. Um, but I wouldn't be performing any like sutures or stapling or anything like that. Just because you really want to make sure that wound is clean. If you have an open wound and you close it without getting it completely flushed out and everything, you can actually have bacteria grow in that wound and it can start to um, abscess. So that's where the body's reacting to all of that bacteria and it gets very, very infected. And that's much worse than just treating the wound from the initial standpoint where we're able to flush it out and kind of clean up any edges and then suture it close so that we make sure that those edges meet really nicely and that wound closes well. So that would be my hesitation on those, those pre-made kits. It makes me a little bit nervous that it includes like, you know, skin staples and, right. and tourniquets because and I, there's a lot of old wives tales, right? With first aid. So like you hear people talk about when you get a snake bite, what do you do? And we still have people that'll try to like tourniquet a leg when a pet has been bitten by a snake and it actually cuts off blood flow to 
that limb where the bite was. So that's not recommended. And so I would, I would be more worried about using a tourniquet incorrectly. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't include it in my, in my pack. The only time you ever tourniquet something is if there's like an arterial bleed. So if you, if your pet gets a really deep cut and you can like count their heart rate with the blood coming out and it's coming out forcefully and quickly, then I would just put pressure on that wound. You could use a tourniquet just above wherever that bleed is from and then get immediately to a veterinary facility. But I I think that that would really be the only instance that I would consider tourniqueting a wound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was kind of my concern with the kits. So I don't actually carry any dog first aid kits with me, but when we travel, you know, you mentioned the medications and only the ones prescribed by your vet. And that's actually what we do. We make sure that anything that has been prescribed, whether it's for, you know, we have some stuff on hand for nausea and for pain. We have senior dogs. So that's kind of one of those things we have to keep in our back pocket, but we'll take that with us. Um, and then we'll also take some like different digestive stuff just based on, again, whatever the vets have recommended kind of over time and then like clean towels, that sterile water. So I think that makes sense. Kind of making a kit kind of fit your needs. And like you said earlier about the environment, you know, if you're going to be out hiking or camping, that might look a little different than traveling to a big city where, you know, you can get to an emergency vet. that I have for my pet is really, um, we jokingly call it our go bag. So I uh, live in the coastal part of Texas. So I'm, I'm south of Houston. And so we have a bag with, um, that we cycle through monthly. We have a preventative for our pet. We have a, we just got a little toy Manchester Terrier. So he's got a heartworm prevention in there. And um, we've got a little baggie of his food I've got his documents that I might need and then, um, you know, a blanket and all of that in a bag. So in the event I were to have to evacuate quickly because there's a hurricane because happy hurricane season, Mm -hmm. um, we can just grab that bag. And I know that I have all of his things ready. So that's usually my recommendation for people in their bags. So you said that you have your pain medications and things for your pets, but if your pet has known issues with like anaphylaxis and your doctor has prescribed an EpiPen, if you can get an extra one and keep it in a bag that way in an emergency, you know that you have a backup. That's certainly not a bad idea. If your pet has seizures, keeping some of their seizure medication in that bag, just to make sure that you have it. If there were an emergency and you were have to leave quickly. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. In Florida, we have like a little go, go bin. Um, it doesn't quite have everything you mentioned. So I didn't even think about bringing preventatives. That's actually a good one that I need to add to ours. Uh, so uh, thank you for that tip. Um, right. Well, shouldn't be gone more than a month, hopefully. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you've, you know, you've kind of talked about wound care, Uh, we talked about heat stroke or, you know, just overheating in general. What are some of the other conditions that you think owners need to be mindful of and kind of prompting this question forward? Some of the big ones that I think about are, um, seizures, which I know seizures are rare and they're kind of hard to prepare for, but just one of those topics to talk about maybe choking, you know, you see dogs that choke and maybe owners don't know what to do or dogs getting into something kind of poisonous. Like, what do you think about those topics? And is there anything else that kind of comes to mind with respect to first aid or even just like being knowledgeable and being ready for those issues? A a previous history of seizures, then sometimes a veterinarian Um, I used to work at a hospital with a neurologist. They would send home like a rescue dose of medication. So if you have that, certainly you can administer. Usually we do um, rectally or intranasally. If the pet is having a seizure, you want to try to avoid um, going near their mouth because when they're seizing, they're not aware of what's going on. So you can easily get bitten during those events. So just be very careful and make sure that you don't get near their mouth while that's happening. Um, But it just depends on what may be happening. We see uh, seizures from like epilepsy in the ER, but we'll also see seizures from like toy breed dogs. So something to consider if you have an itty bitty dog and maybe they didn't eat very well or they didn't eat their breakfast and then all of a sudden they're not really responsive and 
you are worried that maybe their blood sugar is low, you certainly could um, take a tiny bit of honey or sugar water and put it on their gums to help with their blood glucose before you go to the veterinarian. That certainly is not is not a wrong thing to do, um, but it would just depend on, on really what's causing the seizures. If your pet has ingested something that you're concerned that that's potentially why we're having a seizure, um, my first thing to do, even like as I'm on the way to the veterinary hospital is to call one of the pet poison numbers. So uh, ASPCA has one and Pet Poison Helpline also has one. Um, and there's a fee to call, but they'll actually look up the medication or plant or whatever it is that your pet ingested. And they'll be able to advise you like, yes, you should induce vomiting. And then they will give you instructions on how to do that. Or they'll say, you know, vomiting is not really recommended in these cases and you just need to go to a vet. But sometimes if maybe your little dog ate your big dog's medication, and then they can actually calculate out the dose of that medication on your pet size. And I've actually seen cases where they're like, you know what, he's gonna be okay, you should be fine. And that can save you a trip to the veterinarian. So certainly that is my go-to if a pet has ingested something. Um, but I would get advice from a veterinarian before you induce vomiting, just because usually what historically people have used is hydrogen peroxide. And mm -hmm. you have to be really careful with the dosing of that because you don't want to give too much, but also it's, it's very caustic. So it can really irritate their esophagus. And so then you're dealing with some irritation and then maybe they vomit and maybe they don't. So uh, we actually have an injectable that we give at the hospital and they have eye drops you can do as well to, to make pets vomit. So we usually tend to recommend that over something like, like hydrogen peroxide and dogs mm -hmm. don't have the same gag reflex that people do. So you're not actually able to like stick your finger in the back of their mouth to try and make them vomit. And um, it's just not going to affect them anatomically the way that it would affect a person. Um, you can do the Heimlich on dogs. So if you have a pet that maybe is got something in the, in the top of their throat, you can try to like force their stomach. You can look at, there's pictures you can see online, how to position them and um, to try and press on their stomach to get that out. You also can very carefully try to reach. If you have like a rawhide in the back of the throat, you can try to grab it out. Um, but other than that, there's not really much you can do for choking if you can't reach it, just because usually we end up having to like sedate them and go to the back of their throat and get it. So I, I would recommend trying the Heimlich or getting the, the piece out if you can reach it in the back of their mouth. But again, just doing it cautiously to make sure that you, you don't get injured in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, apart from that, uh, you asked a little bit about, um, CPR and the questions that you, that you sent me. And I did want to give a little bit of a plug. I'm a, a recover certified instructor for veterinary hospitals. And so uh, one of the things that recover does offer is they offer a, a pet first, uh, pet like first responder CPR course. So you can actually um, take the online portion there and it talks a little bit about basic life support. If your pet were to have like a, a cardiopulmonary arrest and you needed to perform CPR. They talk about proper chest compressions and about like mouth to snout breathing so that you can perform CPR on your way to a, an emergency facility. So I think that's certainly useful if you're in an area where you're, you're concerned that you might need to know that or it's information that you'd like to know. Um, it's certainly something that's offered and we've had We've half had owners that have performed CPR on their pets and they come in and, and then we do continued care. But if the owner hadn't intervened, that pet probably would not have made it. And what's that program called for the it's CPR? Called Recover, R-E-C-O-V-E-R. It's a nonprofit organization and it's evidence-based CPR and it's through the um, Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care Society. So they offer certifications for uh, veterinary staff and veterinarians, but they also offer a course now for pet owners and pet professionals so that you can also be certified in CPR. Oh, awesome. That's great to know because um, that was one of the things I was going to ask you is, you know, where should 
people go to learn CPR for dogs. You know, some people don't even think about it. And then if they do, they might just Google it. And we know sometimes Google can get you in trouble. Um, So it's nice to know that there's a course out there that not only vet professionals, but also dog owners can use. So that's fantastic. Thank you. So that is the things that you do before you get to like IV catheters and medications and, and breathing for them. So there's a whole first step that you do that's effective chest compressions and you can do mouth to snout breathing. And really that is more important. The chest compressions are what makes the the blood circulate. And so that is really more important sometimes than the advanced life support portion, because if you're not doing good basic life support, then your advanced life support is not going to be successful. So pet owners can learn that basic life support and really what they can do in the interim on your way to the veterinary hospital. But I've seen people doing CPR in their car as they pull up to the hospital. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving us that information. Um, And we really appreciate you being on the episode and teaching us about first aid, giving us some of these tips and tricks. I think it'll be really helpful for all of the listeners. Thank you for tuning in to the Canine Culture Podcast. Please make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform and make sure you're following us on social media. If you have any recommendations, any topics that you'd like to hear, if you know of any guests that would be good for the show, or if you yourself want to be a guest, please reach out to us. Send us an email at canineculturepodcast at gmail.com or send us a direct message on social media. Thank you for listening and please share this with any of your dog loving friends.